Hello and welcome to the 30th Conference for Computational Biology here in Madison, Wisconsin. Today we're going to be taking a look at AIQC on the open source bioinformatics track. My name's Lane Sadler. I'm the creator of AIQC and it stands for Artificial Intelligence Quality Control. In bioinformatics, we spend so much time quality controlling the data that goes into our experiments. Yet, with the increased dependence on artificial intelligence to get to the conclusions that we need, you see a reduction in analytical rigor in the scientific method, and the framework aims to address that in helping evaluate your models. And make sure you uphold data science best practices along the way as an end-to-end -end framework that helps you go from raw data to insight. It's open source, it's declarative, and it's designed to be easy to use to make deep learning accessible for researchers. I'm happy to share it with you. So what does it actually do? At its core, AIQC is an experiment tracker. I started out by solving my own problem, looking at the existing experiment trackers in the space, and I didn't really find their APIs intuitive. I wanted something that worked in Python that I could just use you know, intuitively in a Jupyter notebook. I didn't want to manually run and log things in the command line using YAML files. It just didn't really make sense with my data science workflow. So. AIQC will pass in hyperparameters as keyword arguments to your uh, model components, which are just functions. And where the value starts to come into play is in the automated evaluation of models. For every split, you know, cross folds, or supervised instance, it's going to provide you metrics and charts based on the type of analysis that you're conducting. And in getting involved with how the data was stratified and structured, and this is a key point for differentiation, what it allowed me to do was take more responsibility for the orchestration of the workflow end to end. So both the pre-processing and post-processing of the data and eliminating data wrangling in a more declarative approach. If I want to conduct permuted feature importance, it's really easy to do so because I know how the data is structured. If I want to conduct inference, it's easy to do so because I've recorded how the data was prepared initially. All of this, the end-to-end -end framework, is a simple Python package, open source, pip install. And when you import a library, what it's going to do is automatically create a local lightweight SQLite database to keep track of the objects that are used. It's like object-oriented building blocks for machine learning. And then finally, there's a dash plotly user interface baked into that Python package that allows you to evaluate your experiments and interpret them. So I mentioned building blocks for machine learning. And what you get when you stack those up into workflows is a massive reduction in the amount of data wrangling that's required to conduct rigorous deep learning experiments. And that makes it much more approachable to researchers because they may not be world-class programmers that might be able to construct their own system or code it from scratch. What we have here in this table is all the common types of deep learning analysis that are supported by AIQC. So the top row is the type of data, tabular, like a spreadsheet, sequence, like time series or DNA, image data. These are really just shapes of data. And on the left, we have the type of analysis that's being conducted. So classification, what is it, quantification, how much of it, and forecasting, as well as other unsupervised workflows. For a little bit of eye candy, what we have here is a user interface for experiment tracking. So based on the experiment that you select, it's going to show you all the models within a certain threshold of performance. And you can change what type of performance you're looking at. Each trace corresponds to a model, and then each point that you see on that trace corresponds to a split or fold or inference that has been conducted by that model. If you click on it, what it's going to do is show you the parameters that were used for that model. You can start it and save it and favorite. Taking a look at the next tab in the user interface, it's model performance. So you can compare models head to head to really dig into any biases that they may have or areas where they accelerate or outperform each other. And again, you've got automated metrics and charts for every split and or fold of every model that you've trained, which makes it really easy to figure out 
you know, what's the best model? Where does one have certain biases or accelerate over the other one? This is a classification analysis. So all the plots are related to interpreting classification analysis. And then finally, this is what I built for this conference. It's a UI for simulation or inference, making machine learning predictions. So on the left, you've got all the features that would be fed into that model, automatically populated with you know, the median value for the data set. You can hover over um, the name of the column, and it will show you a distribution um, to help you guide your selection. And they're presented in rank order according to feature importance, so it's really easy to tweak them and perhaps get a different prediction. On the bottom, we've got a sigmoid for binary classification, and on the top, we've got a multi-label classification where you can see the probability of each category of prediction. As a byproduct of building this framework, what you essentially get is a unified API that takes the disjoint worlds of deep learning and open source Python data science and brings them together in one interface that's easy to use. Where did this all come from? How did it get built? Well, people are typically surprised when they look at my background and they see, oh, you didn't go to school for bioinformatics or machine learning or computer science, any of that. I'm largely self-taught. However, my trade is in product strategy for cloud analytics platforms and you know, enterprise cloud data storage, right? And I have had one successful exit in building Athlete Studio in partnership with my co-founder, Nicholas Lemieux. And we sold that to an Andreessen Horowitz company. And where genomics starts to come into play is Wuxi Nextcode. So, you know, Nextcode comes from Decode. And Decode really spearheaded population genetics and whole genome sequencing the entire population of Iceland to look for risks, right? And in order to handle the scale of that data, they had to build the genomically ordered relational database, GORE. And um, Halkin Gubertson was the GORE father. I was happy to work with him at Nextcode, doing product strategy for the cloud analytics platform, taking it to market with Big Pharma. Uh, where Wuxi comes into play is Wuxi AppTech, right? So we had this end-to-end -end offering of sequencing data management. And eventually, cohort data analysis in working with the top five pharma to mine UK Biobank at, you know, just as the data was being released. Really exciting time. We eventually acquired Genomics Medicine Ireland because they were taking a more targeted approach in the diseases they were going after and working with the hospitals and also gathering really strict phenotype data that would allow you to tease apart these diseases and their subtypes. And now I'm happy to say that in um, founding AIQC, just got access to TCGA through dbGaP, and we're going to do a collaboration with Dana-Farber and UAB to look at the overlap in kidney cancer and bladder cancer and do some self-supervised techniques to try to look at what's actually driving the disease in a unique way. A study that I already did with AIQC was a collaboration with Harvard Med where we were looking at post-translational protein modifications of the tau protein in the brain. It's a key biomarker of Alzheimer's. And what it normally does is it functions as a cast that holds the neuron together. But as the protein starts to get modified, it gets all tangled up. So the question was, you know, we have all this data. They did a study you know, using their own statistical uh, approach and they wanted to know, can we use deep learning to get a more predictive model and permute that to see the sites and types of modifications that are actually driving the disease. The answer, it, it, the answer is always yes. As long as you have the data and there's enough variance in it, deep learning will allow you to tease out um, what's driving the biology, right? So here you can see the sites and the uh, uniprot IDs, the leading protein position of what's actually driving the degradation of the tau protein. As a product developer, you're always taught you know, the most important question you can ask is, what problem does that solve when you introduce a new feature or functionality or product? And we've been conducting association studies since the Victorian age. And firsthand, working with Big Pharma on such important cohorts to you know, tease apart what's going on with these diseases, I kept waiting for someone to say, now's the time when we start to use deep learning but it never happened, right? And I think part of that is kind of the skill set trifecta that in order to implement deep learning, 
you have to not only understand data science, but also like software engineering, because the you know, it's hard to keep track of everything that's going on and bioinformatics. So you've got pharma defaulting to GWAS as their primary tool, right? And the problem with association studies is that you can't look at multimodal data and, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you couldn't look at disease subtypes. It was only binary, like yes or no. And as it was alluded to in the keynote, the very first keynote of this conference, how many hypotheses are we testing when we're looking at every position in the genome compared to uh, a phenotype or a FIWAS in reverse, right? It's, it's a lot. It's not a unified model. You can't do time series analysis, although you can get polygenic risk scores. It's not really, it's not a predictive model. It's not what GWAS was intended to do. And then finally, it's not designed for parallelization because a lot of these algorithms are really just you know, uh, a PhD thesis or some grad students work on pushing the next form of fine mapping a little further down the functional biology path. In contrast, neural networks are extremely flexible, almost too open-ended. Um, you know, the workflows are like um, scattered across the internet in cookbooks. And so that's something I tried to do in um, AIQC was standardize them. So on the left, you start with information and on the right, you produce information. It doesn't really matter what that information is. It could be a conclusion like, you know, a classification or a regression, or it could be new data, generating new data. It's just going to drive down loss in trying to answer the question that you ask it. And these, in contrast, are extremely well optimized, like TensorFlow is going to abuse your cores. Uh, the algorithms solve themselves um, through automated differentiation. So whatever the question you want to ask, again, the spoiler alert, the answer is, can you use deep learning to do it? Yes. Uh, it's just, you know, do you have the right information to answer the question at hand? And that's where it's a cooperative, you know, human machine symbiotic experience. You need the domain knowledge to ask the right questions. Um, and it's nice to have this tool because you don't have to wait for the next fine mapping algorithm to come out. You can just ask it yourself with deep learning. So just to kind of re recapture things, you can use multimodal data, time series data. You can look at disease subtypes with multi-label classification. And of course, you can still do uh, regression, right? Problem is, Anytime you change the type of data that you're working with or the type of analysis you're doing, you're going to be out on the internet looking for new cookbooks, right? Uh, because the workflow, there's a lot of glue code um, that strings together the different stages of the workflow as you move from raw data to insight, right? It's still kind of the wild west. And each member of a team or each team within an or organization might be taking a different approach as they manually patch together these kind of Frankenstein glue code configurations. Um, along the way, there's a lot of data science best practice pitfalls. And, you know, the top half are largely solved by introducing more stratification to the data and being more strict with how you prepare each stratification and when you actually review it, like evaluation bias. Like you really shouldn't look at the actual holdout data until You've, you've tested a few models and you're happy with how it performs on the, the validation data. And then the bottom half can be solved by keeping track of the experiment um, over time. Not only how it was constructed, but how it's actually performing, right? So that's why you want to be able to use um, a tool set that's not only reproducible, but also kind of recording everything along the way. Because in addressing these problems, you'll realize that you're doing more data juggling than you thought you were, especially as you start to work with more complex types of data. For example, if you have an image data set and you add a time dimension to that, like a sliding time series window, that pretty much becomes like seven dimensional or something after you factor in batch size and you know stratification of the splits. Uh, so you can't really do stuff like that by hand, you can, but I promise you, you'll make lots of mistakes um, from analysis to analysis, right? Um, and then when you think about the fact that you're training many models uh, against many splits, perhaps cross-validated splits that need to be encoded separately, it becomes way too much and you know the balls start to fall on the floor. 
So you need a systematic approach. And this is really exacerbated by the fact that scikit-learn is designed for working with two-dimensional data. I mean, it's not going to help you with multimodal data. Um, shout out to the Python Software Foundation for helping me pay rent while handling time series data correctly in AIQC. All right, now we'll get into the guts of how AIQC actually works. And under the hood, it's an object relational model for machine learning. So you get these building blocks that you can stack on top of each other to very quickly run your own analyses working with different data types. And what this means is that there's no more data wrangling. There's no more you know, arduous X train Y test uh, scripting that you have to um, do. You use these blocks and there's rules that determine how they work together, right? Like a split set is supervised if it has a label. It's unsupervised if it has features only. Um, and on the left, you see these are the tables of the object relational model. There's lots of them. We're not going to talk through all of them. You stack them together into these predefined workflows for different data types and analysis types. And the code that we'll look at, anytime you see a big screen wall of code, can look a little scary, but there's tutorials that walk through this very simply with examples for different data types, different analysis types, and both you know, TensorFlow and PyTorch. First, we'll take a look at the classes of the API and how they come together, what they're supposed to do. And then we'll take a look at the raw code and just kind of zoom in one layer at a time. So there's three classes in the high-level API, the pipeline for data ingestion, the experiment for training your models, and then inference for actually running um, predictions, right? And inference encodes and preprocesses data using the original pipeline and uses a specific model, right? Here's what those classes actually look like, and it's really this simple, right? So pipeline has features and a label that you want to predict, you know, size of your folds, size of your stratification and test, or just decimals. That's going to cache preprocess data that gets picked up by the experiments. And then it's going to train all of those based on you know, your hyperparameter and fold combinations. Then again, when you want to run inference, you pass in the predictor object and you create new data sets that are going to be processed using the original pipeline. OK, so let's take a look at this object here, right? the inputs, and what one input might look like. So you've got a different data set type, either a tabular sequence, again, for time series or DNA or image. And you can get them from pandas data frames, uh, TSV, CSV, Parquet paths, or NumPy arrays, or MPY paths. Um, and then there's many different ways to preprocess them. And on the right, we'll take a look at um, the encoders. Those are pretty special. So here you can see we're using multiple encoders that will be s applied sequentially to the different columns of our data set. And we're going to target all the float or decimal columns and use standard scale or on them to get them close to, you know, between negative one and one. You want data as close as zero as possible. Uh, then we've got a categorical encoder uh, called the one hot encoder, and that's going to expand, you know, a sparse column for each category. So for each city in our data set, using the city column, because that's what's left over after all the float columns have been used, we're going to one hot encode them and then pass that in as a list to our inputs. And really all the preprocessors are, are that simple. And this is a drastic contrast to the data wrangling that you still have to do when you're using other experiment trackers in the industry. Yes, they provide you a user interface, but all that really does is show you the fruits of the manual labor that you've done because you're still manually logging everything. And um, you'll actually see that MLflow is starting to think about things in the same way as AIQC. And they're starting to use different pipelines. But I think they're about three um, years behind when it comes to the complexities that they're going to run into. Um, PyTorch Lightning is a great way to run um, distributed GPU PyTorch jobs, which I don't know if 90% of the public needs that. But you, you could burst out your AIQC jobs into PyTorch Lightning. And the one thing that you'll notice is that AIQC right now is vertical scale only. And don't get, you can do a lot with 96 cores, uh, but it's nice to run things in parallel. The only reason I haven't you know, picked one yet in terms of a workflow engine is that there's just so many, even in bioinformatics, um, that to go and build for one without some kind of um, go-to-market partnership or institute collaboration 
it's just too much of a risk. And now it's time to pick my head up and start networking and find those collaborations. Great. So we're finally going to get to apply some deep learning. Who thought, right? We'll start with some um, genetic target discovery and then basic stuff. And then we'll get into virtual drug design, right? So this is the data set that's you know, easy to get your hands on. The data is public in TCG anyways, but someone leaked it out onto UCI. It's the expression of um, genes for a thousand patient cohort for five different tumor types. And we're going to try to uh, rank the genes that are driving the expression of these tumors. So this is actual AIQC code. We've got a data set tabular. We're pulling from that um, matrix that we talked about. And here we see the high level API, the pipeline, the input, the target, and the stratifier class all declaratively defined. These are the columns that we want to work with from our data set. They're all just, you know, um, TPMs. So we're going to scale them and then we're going to exclude the class column, which is the tumor type, bad name. And that is going to be one hot encoded for a multi-label classification. Um, you'll notice that I'm, I, I want a larger validation size because that's what the data is actually learning from. And then we have a smaller holdout uh, just to see if it actually works. Okay, the experimentation code. So here we've got a function to build and a function to train. Um, function to optimize, predict, and lose are automatically uh, selected based on the type of analysis. This is a multi-enable classification and we're using uh, TensorFlow. So that changes the type of tensor used behind the scenes. Um, this is a pretty simple model. It's just linear, one hidden layer, and the hyperparameters are a dictionary, right? We don't have to use YAML. Those get passed into every model component and we access them just from a dictionary. So HP init. And if I had a list of um, initialization types, um, a different model will get trained for each one, like a, in a grid search fashion. There's also um, other search strategies like a search percent, but I don't believe in um, optimized searches because you should really only be testing a few independent variables at a time and they're all kind of they're not really independent anyways. So you should really only be doing a few iterations. We've got a lot of slides to get through. Um, permutation count, because there's, uh, well, I'm only going to train one model, so I'm just going to permute that seven times, and we'll get the feature importance from that. OK, and here's the results. And this was in like 10 epics or something ridiculous. I was blown away. It really says that you know tumors are a function of expression, because it's 100% accurate in the first try against train validation and test. And that to me doesn't say this is overfit. It just means that the variance is so blatant that it's easy to do. You could probably just count the genes, honestly, um, count the TPMs. So here um, is, I'm going to move myself so you can see the most important gene down there. I think these are entrees IDs. They weren't annotated. But when you want to call these plots, it's just plot feature importance with the number of features you want to see, or plot confusion matrix. And all the splits are there. You don't have to do any wrangling. You can see all the labels are actually decoded, and the features are decoded as well. Um, and on, we could go through other examples using different data types, but it's boring because it's de so declarative that the only thing that changes is the data type. So we're going to go through um, an example, um, another tabular example for drug design. And here, the data is not so clean, right? It's extremely imbalanced. Less than 1% of the compounds from our high throughput screening experiment are active. And we're going to be looking at the, the MAP-K pathway, some kind of kinase. And we want to rank the structural characteristics in our compounds that drive the you know, active versus inactive state of the compounds. Then we're going to use our model and create virtual drugs um, by playing around with the loss space. OK, and we're just going to, the code's pretty similar to the last time, so we're going to jump straight into the interpretation of the model. Um, there were only two relatively predictive models. And by that, I mean like when you get above 50% consistently, that's kind of when you're learning some patterns. This to me just means that it's not a problem with the model architecture because I tested many different architectures. This is about, you know, is the variance actually there in the high throughput screening data? The answer is no. And I'm going to run with this model because it's simpler than the next model. And we could, you know, scroll through and compare um, these models. It's got a bit of a smoother learning curve. Um, 
you, you can also get a rock curve in addition to precision recall. And I think this one's actually better at predicting uh, success uh, because we want that because there's only a small fraction of success and we want to make a successful drug. We don't really care about predicting or making unsuccessful drugs. And if we look at the feature importance, both of these models are prioritizing hydrogen bond donors and among some other features that we can tweak. So here's what it looks like when we actually go to run the prediction. If we just run the median values for every feature through the model, you can see that the compound is going to fail. And this is a sigmoid function of probability for binary classification. But if we tweak, and these are these again, these features are in rank order of feature importance. So the right, the best ones bubble up to the top. I think there's something like 200 features, um, and we can change a few of these values. I'm not a chemist. This should really be done by a chemist or some kind of uh, chemistry penalized um, reinforcement model. But just flip it a few of these, we get 95% probability, and you know, I'm, I'm confident that we, if we sent this over to the chemistry team, they could kind of tweak it and make it work. All we have to do is get into the success category, especially with the FDA approval, of, you know, benefits the majority. And this right here is what I love about the symbiosis of artificial neural networks that were designed by biological neural networks. We, as humans, can use our brains to explore this virtual lost space, just like a machine learning algorithm. You know, we can seek to find our own global minima and global maxima, just like rolling a ball down a hill. All you saw, we, we went from less than 50% to almost 100% probability by flipping a few switches. So anything is possible as we continue down this path. If you look at the big picture, where is AIQC headed? Well, if we want to get this in the hands of people that are actually doing the research and designing the therapeutics, then we need to partner, right? We need to serve a broader user base. And there's a lot of great open source and commercial opportunities for this, where there are platforms that already exist out there for processing multi-omic data, designing cohorts, and running statistical analyses. But we talked at length about the benefits of using deep learning and the declarative approach. I think part of the reason why these players might be incentivized to make this jump now as opposed to you know two years ago is the entrant of these new players that are more data science heavy from the ground up. And if you look at the other trend in um, biopharma and artificial intelligence, they're starting to scoop up drug design and knowledge mining companies, right? And this is not only a single signal of validation that AI is here to stay as a pillar of biopharma, but it's also going to make things harder for early stage labs and biotechs to compete for machine learning talent. So uh, it's great that there's a tool that can help existing researchers bridge the gap in an easy, um, user-friendly fashion, right? So you, know, you don't want to have to compete for ML talent with both big pharma and fang companies. You don't want to have to retain that talent, you don't want to have to build your own ML platform in-house. So you can adopt AIQC, I can help you patch any holes to you know get it up to speed for your use cases, and then in the long term you can build a machine learning competence around that framework. So thank you so much for having me here at the conference, especially as a non-academic, it really means a lot to have a chance to speak here. If you want to get in touch for a collaboration, my contact info is there. And again, there's a link to the uh, documentation in the slides. Thank you.